I'm Sachi, Sachi Cole, you may have seen my rolling ball head, <laughs> what you just watched. Um, I'll do some introductions really quick. Uh, we have lots and lots of questions. So we have Kate Taylor, senior correspondent of Business Insider, and Brian Kern from all of that, and Giovanni Daniels from all of that, and Draco from Drake and Josh, and Schwartz, co-executive producer and director, and Mary Robinson, Robertson, excuse me, executive producer and director. Let's start with you. Uh, the genesis of Quiet on the Set was your reporting at Business Insider in 2022. So what made you want to investigate this? Yeah, something that I think um, really stood out to me on this was there had been all these rumors and conversation online for quite some time. And I think often with those, it's easy to think like, this is an open secret. But I was really interested in hearing from people kind of being able to elevate people's voices who actually experience these things and could kind of distinguish rumors from actual fact. And that was what started uh, kind of what would become an investigation, which would become what you guys just saw. Yeah. Um, Mary, what about this story spoke to you? And what was your approach in entering it? Thank you, Sachi. Um, so Emma and I and some of our colleagues at Maxine Productions a couple of years ago noticed these compilations of videos online. They were comprised of clips that were filmed on some of the sets that Dan presided over. Um, and there was a lot of uh, comments <laughs> around these compilations. They featured kids in situations, young teens in situations that are arguably sexual in nature. Um, in one, you see Ariana Grande upside down on a bed, pouring water on herself. In another, you see Ariana Grande squeezing her potato in a manner that's arguably sexual in another. Um, Jamie Lynn Spears receives a squirt of a viscous liquid on her face in a manner that's arguably evocative of pornography. And <clears throat> the questions that, you know, were evident online, a lot of them were from kids who had grown up watching these shows and were now adults, and they wondered, um, did I grow up watching content that was sexual in nature but didn't realize that it was sexual in nature because I was a kid? Um, and if material like this, that was arguably sexual in nature, had been made, um, who on set said yes to this? Which adult said yes to it? Which adult said no to it? Um, and, you know, beyond that, if there, if this material was created, what does that suggest about um, what other transgressions um, or bad behavior ranging from the, you know, inappropriate to the illegal might have been happening on these sets? And you know, those felt like a really meaningful set of questions to us, in part because they pertain to the working environment of children, full stop. Um, and then it, in part because what was made on those sets was then transmitted out to the world and absorbed by children. At this point, I would say millions of children, and it helped shape their sense of what normal is um, and who and what we can and should be. So we dug in and very soon came across Kate Taylor. Well, Kate published her wonderful article that really advanced the reporting on this, was taking the, these questions very seriously too. We partnered with Kate and Business Insider. Um, we dug in a little bit and worked to expand the source list at that point. And then we quickly brought it to Jason Sarmanis at the D and um, he got it immediately, became a passionate and devoted supporter of this from the onset, and I think understood the power inherent in this project from the onset. And here we are. And it was easy the whole way. <laughs> <laughs> well, Emma, you uh, managed to secure some really groundbreaking interviews for Quiet On Set. I'm curious what that process was like and how you managed to find all these voices. So, um, I wish there was like a magic trick to uh, explaining what we do, but um, you know, I began my career as just a, a reporter talking to people, and so I always just want to understand where people are coming from and reach out to as many people as possible. And the reality of that is most people don't want to talk to you. Most people don't respond or they're not interested. But sometimes when you're reaching out, you start to, to hear from people and you realize that you're onto something, and there's people who may or may not be ready, but they're encouraging you to go on. And that was something that you know, really happened with this project. Um, <laughs> and for everybody, it's a different, it's a different story. You know, um, Brian, I think I reached out to you. I think I actually spoke to your mom before. <laughs> and, um, you know, 
it took a, it took a few times before we, we spoke, but I feel like once we did, there was like, if you're listening, there's a connection, you, you keep that conversation going. Um, you know, Gio, I know like everyone's telling me, you gotta talk to Gio. Gio, Gio cares everything, Gio knows everything. And uh, she knows quite a lot. Um, but what we were talking about this earlier, you weren't like ready, you weren't sure. And you know, I, I, I know. I was sure. I just wasn't saying that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and I thought that might be that way for a while. But you know, you start to talk to people sort of in in that universe and talk to people you know. And I think as I got to know them and you spoke to them, they're like, okay, Emma's not too crazy. You can talk to her. And you know, we started that conversation. But it's not like you talk to someone and you're like, okay, let's jump on camera. That's not easy. And um, it took a number of conversations to get to that point where, you know, you felt comfortable. And <clears throat> likewise. Like no, I feel ready. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, first moment. Um, first, first text message. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you react to the scariest. No, not to, to reach out to, but to, to figure out how to do that thoughtfully and sensitively. Because, you know, in the course of this project, you know, we came to understand that in a very short period, in 2003, there had been two men arrested on charges and later convicted of child sex abuse who both worked on the same shows and the same show at the same time at Nickelodeon. And that, to me, was like, whoa, that's a striking fact. And how did we not know this? What was happening? And who was hurt? And, you know, in the course of that, I, you know, heard whispers and got to a point where I felt reasonably comfortable that that was probably you. But I didn't know where you were in handling trauma. Yeah, exactly. And, <laughs> and um, I, uh, I wrote a letter. I guess it wasn't too bad. Because you sent me a text message. And, you know, in that message, you know, you, you asked, well, did I know that, you know, Brian had gone on to work at Disney? And in that moment, you know, I knew how raw those feelings still were, that you were at a moment where you were still processing it. And as we got to sort of talk back and forth and get to know each other, it was clear that that was something that you were dealing with. And it was not, it's still a journey. Mm -hmm. um, so part of it is also, I think you get to know people and you're, you're there for that process. It's not like you sit for an interview and it's done. Like we've been in touch throughout that process, <laughs> continue to be, and Probably will continue to be. We love you too, Emma. <laughs> <laughs> um, Drake, the story you tell, quite honestly, is a couple decades in the making. I'm curious how you knew that this was the right time to talk about it. Oh, I didn't know. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, I I've been approached before. Um, because uh, even though I was a John Doe in this uh, case, it, you know, Hollywood's very small, and uh, especially when you work on shows with people, you become sort of like a family, and uh, people talk, and so I, I had been approached by another documentary uh, years ago, and I just was not in a place where I wanted to talk about this or put it out into the world or anything. And, so I expressed that, and, and the response was unbelievable. I mean, they wrote back to me saying that, you know, because of people like you, there's going to be more children hurt in the industry, and it's, uh, you know, you need, you, you, know, you need to speak out, otherwise this is going to continue. It was just, I was like, did you really just send that to me? And I'd be like, I was just shocked. So when Anna reached out, I was very on guard. I was going, you know, I don't, you know, I know how this goes. I've been there. And, um, and so I was like, but I, I don't know what, because I was totally going to ignore it. Um, <clears throat> but I, I don't know what was, it was where I was at mentally at the time. And um, I was struggling a lot at, at that point in my life. And I don't know, I just, started responding and then I would go dark and ghost you for a while. For quite a while, many times. <laughs> and, and then there was, it, there was finally one point where uh, 
you asked me, look, let's just be off the record. Like, can we just meet so I can kind of, you know, you can put a face to these text messages and maybe you'll feel comfortable and you don't have to, you can tell me what you want to tell me about or we can move forward with this or we don't or maybe I can just be an ear that can listen or whatever because you could tell, I think she could tell that I was like, I don't want to do this. All right, um, so do you know about this part of the story? <laughs> you know, so I kept like going back and forth on that and then Emma came out to LA and I was, I mean, I don't know, I don't know what you were looking at on the other side of that table, but I'm sure it was not a pretty picture. Um, and it was the first time that I really spoken about this to uh, to a stranger. You know, so that it's not my family or people I worked with who are close to me who supported me throughout the years. Um, and I just kind of opened it up and was like, this is what's going on and this is a huge issue and, and my biggest concern here is that, you know, like like Emma says, you had two, two, two people working on the same show within a matter of months getting arrested for unspeakable and horrific things. I mean, if I was a reporter, I'd be frothing at the mouth for that story and to illuminate it and, and put it everywhere. But I mean, there were years that I would go and Google and be like, I wonder who's written about this story. It's just nowhere. You couldn't find anything on Brian. You couldn't find, I mean, there was more stuff about um, Jason and articles about that, but you couldn't find anything on Brian. There was like one Daily Mail article like, five years ago, um, and I just was, I was so perplexed by that, and I'm like, you know, this is the response that I feel should have happened so many years ago, is the reaction that, you know, Emma and Mary and everybody from the documentary is having is going, why, well, we have to tell the world about this, and this needs to change, because, like I said, I was like, Emma, you know, he went on to work like no problem. I mean, he's producing, executive producing movies with children in them. He's working on the Disney Channel. He's moving around. He, right after he was arrested, he left to go work on a film in Arizona before he was sentenced and went and worked on a film in Arizona like it was nothing and then came back, got sentenced. And as soon as he got sentenced, he got a bunch of letters from people saying, you know, I would be more than happy to recommend him. I would be more than happy to attach my name to that recommendation. I would be more than happy to hire him to work around children. That's how comfortable I feel with him. And that, I think, was something that was a catalyst for this for me because the entire time I've been moving through my life, I thought, okay, there's bad actors in Hollywood. Well, obviously there's bad actors in Hollywood. <laughs> there's, there's people in Hollywood you need to watch out for, but that's in karate practice, soccer practice. You go to your your job. It, I mean, any institution, school. It, there's people you got to watch out for, and that's what I thought. But then when she was able to um, tell me that she got the letters unsealed and that I would be able to read them, that's what really just hit me in my heart because the day that we went to his sentencing, I walked in and I was imagining it was gonna be an empty courtroom. I'm in John Doe, they're gonna keep this quiet. We're just gonna get through this sentencing today and it's okay, whatever. So I walked in with my mom, my stepdad, my brother, and his entire side of the courtroom was full of actors and producers and writers. And he just, I'm young and old and minors and young actors and peers of mine and people I've grown up watching. Um, and I, I was just blown away, but I didn't know the extent of the support until I saw the, the letters. And Emma, Emma was really sensitive with giving me the letters. She was, I was like, I was like, just read them to me, just, just read them to me on the phone. She's like, no, I need to like, 
I need to deliver these to you in person and sit down and go through them with you because it did make me lose some of them. Did, oh, did, did, I, did I? Yeah. Well, well, what really hit me was it was one day I was in my backyard. You called me and you said, "Okay, I have the letters. Can I go through some of these names with you?" And some of the names you were coming up with, I was like, "Yeah, okay, I know they were in the letter. I didn't know what the letter contained, but I knew that I know that person wrote a letter. Okay, that doesn't surprise me. That doesn't surprise me." And then she started getting to names that I was going, whoa, 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 wait, what? She goes, yeah, do you know this name and this name? And I just went, no, please tell me you know your letters, please. This person was my favorite director that I worked with, like my favorite, I requested him on Drake and Josh, and this was written prior to working on Drake and Josh, and I'm going, wait, he wrote a letter? And and this person who I, I ended up working with on Drake and Josh every day for four years and was basically like my boss that I had to answer to, like, she wrote a letter? Like, th and then it just started blowing my mind and it, it showed me that there was way more to this than just these certain people you have to watch out for. Right. That it's like a whole group of, of like it's a whole, con everyone's connected and supporting and helping and rehiring and, and so, that's when it, it started to snowball into, all right, this story needs to get out because this is really, this is a much bigger issue than I had ever imagined. Thank you. Jim, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, what you discussed on the doc, which is a lot about the racism that you faced on all that. I want to know how you grappled with that experience now as an adult, looking back. I mean, of course, we always want to change what could happen back then, but I'm, I don't know how to answer this, but just to teach people to do better. I'm glad that there are some sad laws, like recently with the, with the hair and makeup, like yeah. that's a huge thing. You know, ha having people say, oh, what do we do with those things? That's, you're, you're talking to a child and that's my hair. That was an issue. Had to request, had to request certain things because it just it was overlooked. Or in our case, we had to play roles that were stereotypical. Like, as a child, you don't have that language to defend yourself. You know it's wrong, but who do you talk to? Who do you, what do you do? Especially when this is your job or your first job. Yeah. Now I just. I try and teach my students or anybody that asks, like, hey, if you know it's wrong, say something. Because it's not going to change until someone speaks up. Yeah. Brian, I'm going to ask you about your mom. <laughs> I know everybody asks you about your mom. We all love your mom. She was so fiercely protective of you. What did that protection feel like when you were a kid? And then do you feel like the onus of protecting kids in these contexts is that on the parents or is it on the production? Um, that's a good question. It's okay to ask me about my mom. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of stuff on the internet. Like, oh, your mom. Yeah. <laughs> She's good people. Um, I think that, um, I don't think it's on the parents. Um, I think that it's important to have people on set um, who, whose job people who are tasked to give care and caretake to the emotions of the children on set. Um, I think that's the most important thing. The parent can only do so much. And I think that that also is something that needs to change is like, don't be a director on the set shooing the parent away from the actual set. Because in our case, in my case, the damage happened when the cameras were rolling. It wasn't necessarily so much when I was in the green room. It was directly when they said action and my mom was being shooed to the green room. That was when it was like, are we being attacked? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know um, my mom's not in the makeup room. The charcoal statement came out in the makeup room. And so, you know, there's not, there's no one in, within earshot. 
I think there should be someone within earshot to say, yo, that was crazy. Yeah. And we're gonna have to go talk about this to somebody higher up because- And it needs to be somebody that's not just production, but yeah. like can be the liaison between production and parent and child. Yeah. My mom is a protector through and through. And it's like good and bad for her. It's like to a fault, like she's going to do that thing. And don't tell her that she's doing a good job at it because then she'll overdo it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, at the time, it's, yeah, it's something that I, I did, I did, I'm like, oh, I felt protected by my mom all the time. I'm going to tell my mom. But there was a, there was a time when I realized that one, you know, as a kid, you're manipulating the situation in certain circumstances. But then when you get on set in a professional setting, like, I could tell my teacher at, at school and say, oh, I'm gonna tell my mom and then get my way, right? But on set, this is different. This is a whole different place where she quite literally raises hell. At school, they're not gonna fire me. I can't, you know what I mean? They get fired from school. Like, fire me from school at 10 years old, please. I could be home. That sounds great. That sounds great. But and when you're in a position where you feel so obligated to keep this job, like, no, like that's a hard thing as black children. Um, Drake, probably you too, I'm sorry. <laughs> you're not a black child, but you're over here with us today, Drake. Oh my God. You know what I mean? Make a good point. It's a, it's it's really difficult for uh, to have that pressure of being we have to, I have to keep this job. Yeah. You know, luckily, luckily, yeah. I didn't have to. You know, I, I know this is for a lot of kids in the industry where there are the breadwinners, they are the financial responsibility, yes. so that that's an added pressure from the family. Yeah. Um, luckily, I, I didn't have that, but it doesn't take away from you know I want this job, I need this job. This is going to get me to the next point. Yeah. And I think that that's another another good point is, you know, we hear a lot, well, where were the parents? Well, if, if I was their parent, where were their parents? And you have to understand, we're kids. Some of these are our first jobs. Some of this is our first, our parents' first time on a set. And they, they're just learning along with us. So to to say, oh, the, the parents should have stepped in with this or that, it's like, no, there should be somebody who's experienced yeah. that can see, oh, you know what, this child feels uncomfortable. I'm gonna be able to, you know, I'm gonna be able to take him or her with the, with their parent and, and bring them over and go, do you feel comfortable doing this? I see that you're not feeling, I, I can tell this and this, and I can tell this and that. And, but, but to, you know, say, oh, it's the parent's responsibility, I mean, they're just learning along with us and don't have the experience on these movie sets yeah. to be able to push and pull their weight. And then they fall into something like your mom where it's like, well, she was we gotta get rid of, we, yeah, we gotta get rid of this one. She, yeah, she, she's pushing back too much. So, you know, in, and in turn, well, get rid of uh, the child as well. Right. And so then, and then that has a lasting, uh, 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 effect on, mm -hmm. on our mentality and our mental capacity moving forward in the industry and yeah. feeling accepted and going to auditions after you've been fired and you yeah. know, it's, it, it, it affects it all. Um, and also your family dynamic at home going through something like that. So I think that putting it all on the parents is difficult because they're just an, ex is, is an experience and sometimes it's their first time on a movie set too. Yeah. You know, so. Well, the three of you have been talking about this now as adults. What does that feel like? Do you see anything differently? Has your perspective shifted? Do you think of yourselves as children differently now? I definitely. I mean, um, dang, I'm going to say it. I'm going to say the, the thing that I always say. As a black man. Black <laughs> therapy. <laughs> oh, talk louder. Yes. <laughs> As a black man in therapy, uh, you start to, I mean, you know, it, it definitely, uh, yeah, you're looking out, you know what I mean, I'm all here, here, you know what I'm saying, trying. Um, you do spend a lot of time holding space for your 
for ourselves. Um, and as a child actor, former child actor in therapy, I've had to spend a lot of time with that kid. And he is angry, not even at his mom. I wasn't mad at my mom. And I kind of want to clear something up about the narrative that's being spun about whether or not I've, I've been in touch with my mom since then. I didn't like leave all that and my mom. <laughs> we have had a tumultuous relationship. Um, but, and then, you know, we, we're on again, we're off again, we're on again, we're off again. Right now we're on again, and it feels permanent. Um, and that's really good because, you know, there's hard conversations that have to be had now, you know what I mean? Like, you have to, like, really spend time saying, this hurt me, and I'm sorry that this hurt you, and really take accountability, you know, unlike some people on the TV screen. Well, on that note, <laughs> um, yeah, I, looking back on it now, and I've, I've said this before in another interview, there are a lot of broken pieces but some of them are still good. You know, I don't look at this as a total loss because I did meet some amazing people along the way. And I she met me. <laughs> she has a lot. Good brother, good brother vibes. She had great too. <laughs> I, 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 I met some amazing people. Like, I, I always say that all that, that's my high school reunion when we get together and meet up because Nobody understands us like us. So I don't want to completely lose that aspect of it. You know, and, and it's still my career. It's still something I'm very proud of. But two things can be true at the same time. And that part needs to be dealt with, not just because I went through it, but because nobody should have to go through it. It, it just needs to be fixed. Drake, how do you do something? Drake, how do you feel talking about it now? How do you look back on all this? <laughs> give, give me your shortest answer for the world's largest um, question. <laughs> I, 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 I'll, I'll mirror kind of what she just said, because I do look back on those times in my life with such fond memories, and I have dear friends that I worked with that I talk to today on a weekly basis, daily basis, that um, have supported me through the years and I've just become great friends with. And I don't, you know, watch episodes of Drake and Josh in horror and go, oh man, this was the, this terrible time in my life and oh, I know exactly what I was going through in, during this episode. And um, so it's, it's a bittersweet thing where you know, I, I, I love to look back and watch Drake and Josh episodes and Amanda show episodes and I laugh and I can't wait to share it with my son. And, um, but, you know, it's, I'm, I'm in the thick of it right now. I'm, I'm in the fire right now because it's, having this sensitive of a story and something that I've held inside for so many years and never knowing, uh, you always imagine, okay, if I ever come out, how am I gonna do it? How am I gonna say it? Who's gonna be the, the like, would it be reporter? Uh, do I talk with a reporter in a magazine? Do I do it on a podcast? Or how do I get my story out there? What's it gonna look like? How's the world gonna react to it? How am I gonna be viewed? Um, and especially now with social media, it's just a nightmare. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, I mean, I'm still kind of, reeling with the idea of this all being, you know, my soul kind of being buried to the, to the world. Um, but you see such good coming out of, you know, people are approaching me at the airport on my way here and, and telling me their stories and how they're, you know, have the bravery to come out and speak and how they're trying to go to their legislatures and get things changed and seeing people online and you know it's so you're seeing a change i just you know hollywood's a hollywood's a beautiful place full of fantasy and, and, and imagination and fun but it's also 
you know, a completely dark cesspool of just disgusting waste. And so... It's a beautiful duality. <laughs> It's true, um, but so I'm hoping that we see the shifts and the changes inside the industry that are needed, you know, because as much as I would want to say, you know, answer the question of if your son wants to be an actor, you know, what would you say? Oh, no, absolutely not, like, no way, but I would have, I would, I, 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 it's my air, it's how I breathed when I was a child, it's how I, I, I didn't want to do anything else. I didn't want to play baseball. I didn't want to go play soccer at school. I didn't want to do, no, I wanted to get up on stage and make people laugh. And I was given this outlet to be able to do that every day and, and, and on, on a giant stage and, and, and have, you know, make kids laugh all over the world. And, um, and that's something that I would hate to take away from, from, from somebody just because something in the industry is not changing or being fixed. Yeah. It should be fixed so that, you know, those kids who are the artists, who are, you know, don't, I'm not into sports, you know, like that we should get, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a hard, hard question to answer when, when you're asked, you know, would you let your kids, I don't know, because yeah, I mean, if they're, if that's what their calling is and that's all they want to do and I, do you want to take that away from them, you know? But I would want to make sure that if that's the path that you know a young artist wants to take, that there's things in place that make it possible for things like what we've seen in the documentary and just shared with our stories to never happen again. Yeah. Um. Uh, Kate and Emma and Mary, let me ask you this. The reaction has been pretty enormous. Um, what do you think about the reaction? Are there more stories to tell? Where are we going to go from here? Tell me what's going to happen. Please. <laughs> I mean, I think that we all feel that there are more stories to tell and that um, hopefully we can also make changes now that mean 20 years down the road, there's not going to be another fight on set. That by taking action today and having people watch this and kind of move to listen to kind of what you guys are talking about, this is something that we can address, not just what happened in the past, but what is happening now. Yeah, I think a couple of striking things to me. Um, you know, are certain areas where there's just clear lacks of, lack of protection. You know, if you look at like the federal legislation about like child labor laws from 1938, like child performers are completely exempt. So there's not like inherent protection under the federal law and you have this sort of patchwork of state rules and regulations and there's some clear gaps that um, this you know, documentary highlights. You know, one of those is there's no rule, no law that says someone who's a registered sex offender can't work on sex with kids. Like, full stop, that doesn't exist. Um, and in <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, well, that's what's so one that's so mind blowing is people go, well, how did how would Brian be able to work on a show that's for a kids show if he's and you go, it's, it's, it's very, very, very essentially out of that what you know. Yeah, it's up to a, a company to do checks or not. You know, there's like a California law that was passed, and there's like if you are a man or you have to register, but then like there was an article about how nobody checks on it, so lots of people aren't going to register and don't do those checks. So even within that, but essentially... And as long as there's a caregiver on the set, as right. long as there's adults around, then... They don't have to do these checks. Yeah. Um, you know... Uh, which puts them... Which gives them the opportunity to go right back into the position they were in when they offended. Mm -hmm. The exact same position. Yeah, and we have laws like that for schools, for instance. Um, another... You know, uh, question that's come up that you guys were, were just sort of alluding to earlier is whether there's you know mental health specialists or social workers on set. No, 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 just hold it until your math one. There you go. No, 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 no,
having someone that, that kids can turn to that aren't, you know, their boss, that aren't their parents, that aren't part of the system where they're trying to keep their job on set in a industry that is essentially gig work, where you're relying on your relationships to get your next job because it's not secure. So even if you have a student teacher, they're, they're reporting to the, the network and the showrunner, not to the, not to the kids. Um, and I know that there are some efforts. Um, do you have a slide from there? Yes, there is a program that's called Looking Ahead, and it is with the entertainment fund, but it's a program that you have to opt into. And then secondly, it's not advertised. Like, I just found out about this, and they're getting ready to have their 20th anniversary gala for helping doing the very thing that we said wow. needed to be done on set. And then, you know, one other thing just, you know, that we have conversations with as a result of this is that if you look at where, you know, children's entertainment, so to speak, is today, <coughs> it's not just in studios or in networks, it's on social media. And that is a universe where there's, I mean, almost no oversight as to what's happening inside people's homes, on these screens, as to what is happening to protect those kids as well. Um, because that, in many ways, is the future um, of where so many of us are getting our, our stories and our content. Um, I would say that the response has been overwhelming. <laughs> and um, overwhelmingly positive, but overwhelming nonetheless. And that when you um, begin a project like this, you enter into a type of covenant with the contributors, and you say, hold my hand, let's go on this journey together. Um, thank you for your bravery. This takes so much courage. Um, I, I can't control what will happen when we put this film out there, but I can commit to moving forward with sensitivity and to taking the greatest possible care of your story and to making sure that we get it right. And then it will be to the world, you know, <laughs> to decide what, what, um, what comes of this. But come with me on this journey and, and you know, there's a chance that we'll engage a really large audience and that by engaging this really large audience, um, you know, conversations will be ignited and uh, cultural wars can shift. And, you know, we all sort of held hands and left together. And it's incredible to be in the position that we're in today. And I'm so grateful to everyone that has been watching and talking and <coughs> feeling deeply. And I'm so grateful to everyone who's on this stage with me today. Thank you. I think that's a good place to end it. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for coming and for listening. We're going to ask you all to take a break. We're going to have a snack on break. We're going to do a snack